UOP Multimedia presents The Ominous Continuity with Kevin Cole Creating insights on the history of Western civilization, international relations, education theory, technology, and current events This is episode two, the ideal arrangement of roads in the organic unity of empire. Hello, my name is Kevin Cole and welcome back to episode two of The Ominous Continuity. In the first episode, I opened with a reading of a chapter I authored entitled Professor Carol Quigley in the article that said too little. This was to serve as an introduction to the works of Professor Quigley and some of the core issues, historical significance, and controversy surrounding his research into the Rhodes-Milner Roundtable groups and the aims and accomplishments of the Anglo-American establishment. In episode two, we're going to delve into the history of the Rhodes ideal arrangement via the Confession of Faith document in his last will and testaments, and also take a closer look at some of the lesser-known players, precursors, and ideological foundations for the plot. I'll also be introducing John Robert Seeley, the concept of organic unity, the influence of German romantic nationalism on the British attempts to foster a national culture, and hopefully provide a nice setup for next episode's revelations on the role of the trivium in the empire. Special thanks to everyone for tuning in and your ongoing encouragement and support. If you appreciate my research and analysis and would like to help fund my book and future projects of UOP Multimedia, you can support my work directly at unityofthepolis.com or at patreon.com slash UOP. You can also do so by picking up a copy or subscription to my UOP Research Brain, which is a historical database and mind map containing over 11,000 individual entries and 27,000 links, which I've been compiling since 2009. If you have any questions, interview requests, topic suggestions, or anything at all, please feel free to contact me directly. With that in mind, this is the Ominous Continuity. Thanks for listening. The Ideal Arrangement of Roads and the Organic Unity of Empire by Kevin Cole Have a fixed purpose of some kind for your country and yourselves. Make your country, for all the world, a source of light, a center for peace. This is what England must do or perish. She must form colonies abroad as far and as fast as she is able. John Ruskin, Inaugural Lecture at Oxford, 1870 Mr. Rhodes was more than the founder of a dynasty. He aspired to be the creator of one of those vast semi-religious quasi-political associations which, like the Society of Jesus, have played so large a part in the history of the world. To be more strictly accurate, he wished to found an order as the instrument of the will of the dynasty, and while he lived, he dreamed of being both its Caesar and its Loyola. It was this far-reaching, worldwide aspiration of the man which rendered to those who knew him so absurdly inane the speculations of his critics as to his real motives. William T. Stead the Last Will and Testament of Cecil John Rhodes, 1902. By 1891, the secret society that Cecil Rhodes had called for in his previous wills dating back to his infamous Confession of Faith of June 2nd of 1877 was now beginning to finally take form. He had begun to pin this confession on the same day of his initiation into the Apollo University Lodge, number 357 of British Freemasonry at Oxford. It did not take Rhodes long to express his dissatisfaction with the role of Freemasonry in his time, and he found it to be inadequate in the role of building English gentlemen, and more importantly, in maintaining the seeds of British Empire. Later that year, in his role as the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Carnarvon was named by Rhodes as the executor to administer the Last Will and Testament of September 19th of 1877. Lord Carnarvon had the following to say about the historical role of British Freemasonry. Following closely in the wake of colonization, wherever the hut of the settler has been built, or the flag of conquest waved, their masonry has soon equal dominion. It has reflected and consolidated the British Empire. Lord Carnarvon, 
Grandmaster to the United Grand Lodge of England, Secretary of State for the Colonies from 1866 to 1867 and from 1874 to 1878. Rhodes had felt he could do better. With the inspiration of teachers like Oxford's John Ruskin and his longing for platonic, hierarchical, and medieval structures of society, in addition to the new blueprint for British expansionism put forth by historian John Robert Seeley, Rhodes set forth an elaborate plan to do just that. Rhodes's fourth will in 1891 would leave his fortune entirely to Lord N. M. Rothschild, the same Rothschild who, along with Alfred Bate, had financed Rhodes de Beers Diamond Company and his business ventures in South Africa under the cover of the British South Africa Company, and the acclaimed journalist William T. Stead, who is often credited with popularizing the interview process in the English press. Stead and Rhodes had met in 1889, and Stead was introduced to the Plan Society on April 4th of that year. In February of 1891, Rhodes and Stead had a discussion about the goals and direction of the secret society, and both, quote, agreed that if necessary to achieve Anglo-American unity, Britain should join the United States. This was an early positioning of Britain as an Atlantic rather than primarily European power, and it expressed a willingness to cede certain perceptions of imperial strength for the ultimate unity of purpose they hoped to achieve by intermingling the two countries. Rhodes instead outlined a planned secret society spread amongst two concentric circles of influence to achieve these goals, an inner circle which was known as the Society of the Elect, and an outer circle known as the Association of Helpers. Stead's new magazine, The Review of Reviews, founded the year before, was to promote the ideals of the society under the guise of journalistic objectivity, and this was a strategy also later employed in the founding of the Roundtable's Journal of Commonwealth Affairs in 1910. It's also a feature evident to this day in publications such as Foreign Affairs, the influential organ of the foreign policy think tank, the Council on Foreign Relations, in New York and Washington, D.C. Soon after establishing this framework, Stead was given permission by Rhodes to recruit Reginald Brett and Alfred Milner into the secretive group. From these additional members, the outline of the society was expanded to include a junta of three, made up of Milner, Brett, and Stead, a circle of initiates which included Albert Gray, director of Rhodes' British South Africa Company, Arthur Balfour, and Harry H. Little Johnston. Finally, the arrangement called, quote, for a college under Professor Seeley to be established to train the people in the English-speaking idea. William T. Stead recounts the scheme below. In 1894, Mr. Rhodes came to England and again discussed with me the workings of the scheme, reported to me his impressions of the various ministers and leaders of the opposition who he met, discussing each of them from the point of view as to how far he would assist in carrying out our ideas. We also discussed together various projects for propaganda, the formation of libraries, the creation of lectureships, the dispatch of emissaries on missions of propaganda throughout the empire, and steps to be taken to pave the way for the foundation and acquisition of a newspaper which would be devoted to the service of the cause. William T. Stead, the last will and testament of Cecil John Rhodes, with leadership changes and the dying off of older collaborators, this ideal arrangement constantly evolved from Rhodes' original vision, but what remained was the inner and outer circles of influence and the ultimate purpose of the Imperial Federation of the British Empire by whatever means necessary, even if this meant the proposed Imperial Federation would need to evolve into a more interdependent Commonwealth framework put forth by Lord Rosebery and later Alfred Zimmern and Lionel Curtis. At the time of the writing of the Anglo-American establishment from Rhodes to Cliveden in the 1940s, Carol Quigley maintained that the society still exists to this day, in modified form, and by 1974 was still extremely reluctant to sacrifice his career by revealing too much of what he had learned over the years about the plot. He documented that from 1891 to 1902, the details of the society were, quote, only known to a score of persons, with Rhodes instead in leadership roles. Alfred Milner was the leader in charge from 1902 to 1925, with Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, and Lionel Curtis listed as the, quote, most important members during this period. Kerr then took the lead from 1925 to 1940, followed by Robert Henry Brand, Lord Brand, after Kerr's death. With these shifts in leadership and the direction within the society, the group was known by many names. These included the Secret Society of Cecil Rhodes, the Dream of Cecil Rhodes, Milner's Kindergarten from 1901 to 1910, and perhaps most prominently as the Roundtable Group from 1910 to 1920, there were also other names that denoted the society in its many machinations, including the Times Crowd, the Chatham House Crowd, the All Souls Group, and the Cliveden Set, founded by Vincent Astor. As older members of the society died off, these helper groups were essential for bringing in new recruits into leadership positions in the Society of the Elect. In 1899, William T. Stead was charged with insubordination by Rhodes for publicly admonishing the Boer Wars, orchestrated by Rhodes and Alfred Milner's kindergarten in South Africa and this led to Stead being surpassed in leadership by Alfred Milner, whom Stead had actually recruited to the group in the first place. 
Milner and what we will now recognize as the Milner Group, then modified and expanded Rhodes' societal organization significantly in pursuit of the same goals, with Rhodes' full support. Stead claimed that he was removed from the will by Rhodes because he had not been willing to, quote, subordinate his judgment to the majority of our associates who were on the spot. It was collective thinking and collectivism that Rhodes was ultimately after, and individualism was not to be tolerated. That is a curse that will be fatal to our ideas, insubordination. Do you not think it is very disobedient of you? How can a society be worked if each one sets himself as the sole judge of what ought to be done? Cecil Rhodes to William T. Stead. Professor Quigley, uniquely positioned to write the history of this group, outlined its secrecy and some of its goals and accomplishments as follows. This organization has been able to conceal its existence quite successfully, and many of its most influential members, satisfied to possess the reality rather than the appearance of power, are unknown to even close students of British history. This is more surprising when we learn that one of the chief methods by which this group works has been through propaganda. It plotted the Jameson Raid of 1895. It caused the Boer War of 1899-1902. It set up and controls the Rhodes Trust. It created the Union of South Africa in 1906-1910. It established the South African periodical The State in 1908. It founded the British Empire periodical The Roundtable in 1910. And this remains the mouthpiece of the group. It's been the most powerful single influence in Balliol, All Souls, and New Colleges at Oxford for more than a generation, and it's controlled the Times for more than 50 years, with the exception of three years from 1919 to 1922. It publicized the idea and name of the British Commonwealth of Nations in the period of 1908 to 1918, and it was the chief influence in Lloyd George's War Administration in 1917 to 1919, and dominated the British delegation to the Peace Conference of 1919. It had a great deal to do with the formation and management of the League of Nations and the system of mandates. It founded the Royal Institute of International Affairs in 1919 and still controls it. It was one of the chief influences of British policy toward Ireland, Palestine, and India in the period of 1917 to 1945. It was very important influence on the policy of the appeasement of Germany during the period of 1920 to 1940, and it controlled and still controls to a very considerable extent the sources and the writing of the history of the British imperial and foreign policy since the Boer War. It would be expected that a group which could number among its achievements such accomplishments as these would be a familiar subject for discussion among students of history and public affairs. In this case, the expectation is not realized, partly because of its deliberate policy of secrecy, which this group has adopted, partly because the group itself is not closely integrated, but rather appears as a series of overlapping circles or rings, partly concealed by being hidden behind formally organized groups of no obvious political significance. This group, held together as it is by the tenuous links of friendship, personal association, and common ideals, is so indefinite in its outline, especially in recent years, that it's not always possible to say who is a member and who is not. Indeed, there is no sharp line of demarcation between those who are members and those who are not, since membership is possessed in varying degrees and the degree changes at different times. Quigley contends that the planning stages of a Milner-dominated group really go back to 1873, because of Alfred Milner's own unique positioning in the intersection of three influences, which Quigley calls the Toynbee Group surrounding Arnold Toynbee at Balliol, the Cecil Block of Lord Robert Cecil, and then finally the Rhodes Secret Society with Cecil Rhodes and William T. Stead. Quigley explains that it is doubtful that Milner could have formed this group without the assistance of all three of these sources. These groups intermingled at Oxford and then Balliol in the 1880s included Milner, his closest friend Arnold Toynbee, Thomas Raleigh, Michael Glazebrook, Philip Littleton Gell, and a future Seeley lecturer, a lectureship named after John Robert Seeley, and organizing secretary of the Rhodes Trust and Rhodes Scholarships named George Parkin. Arnold Toynbee died in 1883, and Milner took charge of establishing his legacy and honoring his memory with the settlement house in his name in London. Arnold Toynbee was the uncle of the famous historian of the same name, who would go on to dominate international relations, world history, and the Roundtable Group and Royal Institute of International Affairs in the early 20th century. Degeneration and Imperial Federation. By the late 1800s, there was a growing concern amongst the imperialist politicians and power players that the relationship between the British Empire and its self governing parts had grown too distant, and that greater central authority in England was needed. This occurred amongst a strong opposition to the Little Englander politicians who wished to stop the expansion of empire, who were also heavily critical of the Second Boer War, led by Rhodes and the Milner Group. This emerging imperial scheme was also partially fueled by fears of degeneration and racial decline prevalent during the late Victorian period, influenced partially by Charles Darwin's expression of evolution, 
which Rhodes embraced as the embodiment of future progress and its relationship to natural selection. The thinking was that if an individual could regress and degenerate physically and even intellectually, so too could whole nations and empires. This fear of degeneration not only played an important role in the development of new imperial strategies, it was also a factor in the creation of the pseudoscience of eugenics, as well as the establishment and implementation of compulsory education in 19th century England. One of the most influential members of the Cecil Bloc and advocate of the Imperial Federation League was Cambridge Professor of History and Imperialist John Robert Seeley. In addition to being floated by Cecil Rhodes himself in the ideal arrangement for a college to be established to train people in the English-speaking idea under his name, Professor Quigley also states that Seeley was regarded as a precursor by the inner circle of the Milner Group itself. In a letter Quigley uncovered, Lionel Curtis wrote to Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, in 1916 that, quote, Seeley's results were necessarily limited, and that with the roundtable organization behind him, Seeley, by his own knowledge and insight, might have gone further than us. If we've been able to go further than him, it is not merely because we've followed his train, but because we've also so far based our study on the relations of these countries on a preliminary field study of the countries concerned, conducted in close cooperation with people in these countries. The Influence of Romantic Nationalism and the Strategy of Organic Union In addition to the creating of the English-speaking idea, Another very important contribution to this study is John Robert Seeley's transmission of the concept of organic unity. This concept of organic unity was first brought into England and introduced into literary theory by Samuel Taylor Coleridge through his interpretations of German literary critics like historian August Wilhelm von Schlegel. While he's certainly not alone historically, Schlegel believed that all of the arts made up a comprehensive whole or organic unity and conceived poetry as the most comprehensive and central of these arts precisely because language is the medium of expression. Schlegel also asserted that history and theory were ultimately interrelated and essential to his literary criticism because history teaches us what has been accomplished and theory shows us what is yet to be done. Poetry will be the center and goal of our considerations. In our opinion, that is in fact the place it occupies in the whole formed by art and science. Philosophy is an organon, a method that shapes true, that is divine thought, the thought that is precisely the essence of poetry. Philosophy is thus solely a means of instruction, a tool, and a means for achieving what poetry is. We therefore believe that poetry is the first and most noble of the arts, and of all the sciences, for it is also a science, in the fullest sense of the term, the science that Plato calls dialectic, and Jakob Bema, theosophy. That is the science of the sole true reality. Philosophy has the same object, but approaches it in a negative way, and through an indirect presentation of it, whereas any positive presentation of the whole inevitably becomes poetry. Although taking a more systematic approach characteristic of other German romantics, it would be John Robert Seeley who would seize upon this zeitgeist and to further seek an ideological framing and reformulation of history in historiography to serve the cause of religion. In this sense, it can be said that whoever dominates the historical field and or state system as a universal medium also dominates the interpretation of the true soul reality. Deborah Wormel, in her book Sir John Seeley and the Uses of History, asserts that Seeley's goal in writing and teaching history was to create in the British people a single national consciousness with respect to their past, their mutual obligations, and their destiny of the state. Seeley's The Life and Times of Stein, or Germany and Prussia in the Napoleonic Age, was published in 1879 and the expansion of England in 1883. In his Life and Times of Stein, Seeley became supremely infatuated with the same German romanticism and the role of romantic nationalism on creating and managing the changing body politic. He was heavily influenced by the addresses to the German nation delivered by Johann Fichte in 1807 and 1808 after the Prussian army was defeated by Napoleon at the Battle of Jena, Austerditz in 1806. Seeley calls this work by Fichte the prophetical or canonical book which announces and explains a great tradition in modern Europe. Seeley also spends a considerable amount of time detailing the history of the Tugendbund, also known as the League of Virtue or the Moral and Scientific Union, which he claimed was a quasi-Freemasonic organization founded to boost the national and patriotic spirit after the defeat of Jena and to influence the new military and educational reforms that Fichte put forth. Former New York State and City Teacher of the Year John Taylor Gatto in his 1991 Underground History of American Education detailed that Fichte's addresses to the German nation were also the seed and catalyst of the introduction of compulsory education in the United States and around the globe in the 19th century. Gatto observes that for 1,000 years the Germans had made every effort to reconstruct the universal system, from Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire to the aftermath of Jena in 1806. Among his many reforms, Fichte's addresses specifically called for a new education system under the methods of Johann Pestalozzi, to solidify the new national consciousness. Nearly 75 years later in England, Seeley felt Fichte's ideas, while specifically crafted his arguments for helping the German situation after the defeat of Jena, were also capable of being applied generally. 
a preparation has been made for it in the definition of nationality, the virtue of which has been made to lie precisely in the union of past and present generations, which secures the actions of man and earthly immortality. John Robert Seeley, The Life and Times of Stein. In addition to using Fichte's model as a way to control and foster national consciousness for the British people, Seeley truly sought to perpetuate a spatio-temporal consciousness shift so that the nature of imperial policy could be redirected under the enlarged historical context of Greater Britain. Greater Britain was a phrase coined by imperialist politician and Freemason Sir Charles Dilke in his 1868 book of the same title. In the expansion of England in 1883, Seeley repeatedly reflects on the problems of the Greek and Roman empires and how lessons could be learned to protect the British from suffering the same fate historically. He contends that the only history that really matters is that which, quote, deals with states and investigates their rise and development and mutual influence, the causes which promote their prosperity or bring about their decay. Seeley concludes that the past failures of Britain to fully establish itself in the 18th century were due to a lack of cohesive connective fabric that could maintain a political union over vast distances. He realized that the ability to harness emerging science and technological advances would be the future catalyst for sowing the unity necessary to sustain his reconceptualization of Greater Britain around the world. In the material sense, Greater Britain was created in the 17th and 18th centuries, but the idea that could shape the material mass was still wanting. Towards this, only one step was taken, namely in the laying down of the principle that the colonies did in some way belong with their mother country, that England did in some sense go with them across the sea, and that they could not cease to be English but through a war. And what is true of the English colonies in the 18th century is equally true of the colonies of other states. Greater Britain, Greater Portugal, Greater Holland, and Greater France were all, as much as Greater Britain, artificial fabrics, wanting organic unity in life. Seeley continues, In the last century there could have been no Greater Britain in the true sense of the word, because the distance between the mother country and its colonies, and between the colonies themselves, this impediment exists no longer. Science has given to us the political organism a new circulation, which is steam, and a new nervous system, which is electricity. These new conditions make it necessary to reconsider the whole colonial problem. They make it in the first place possible to actually realize the old utopia of Greater Britain, and at the same time they make it almost necessary to do so. In the old times, such large political organisms were only stable when they were of the low type. Thus, Greater Spain was longer lived than Greater Britain precisely because it was despotically governed. Greater Britain ran on the rock of parliamentary liberties, which were then impossible on so great a scale, while despotism was possible enough. Had it been thought possible to give parliamentary representation to our colonists, the whole quarrel might have been easily avoided. But it was not thought possible, and why? Burke gives you the answer in his well-known passage in which he throws ridicule upon the notion of summoning representatives from so vast a distance. This notion is now feast at any rate to be ridiculous, however great the difficulties of detail may still be. Those very colonies, which then broke off from us, have since given example of federal organization in which vast territories, some of them thinly peopled and newly settled, are held easily in union with older communities, and the whole enjoys in the fullest degree parliamentary freedom. The United States has solved this problem substantially similar to that which our old colonial system could not solve, by showing how a state may throw off a constant stream of immigration, how from a fringe settlement on the Atlantic a whole continent as far as the Pacific may be peopled, and yet there be no doubt which will arise whether those remote settlements will not soon claim their independence, or whether they will bear to be taxed for the benefit of the whole. And lastly, what is thus shown to be possible appears now to be much more urgently important than in the last century for the same reasons which make vast political unions possible, tend to make states which are on the old scale of magnitude unsafe, insignificant, and second-rate. If the United States and Russia hold together for another half-century, they will at the end of the time completely dwarf such a European state as France and Germany, and depress them into a second class. They will do the same to England if at the end of the time England still thinks of herself as simply a European state, as the old United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, such as Pitt, left her. It would indeed be a poor remedy if we should try to face these vast states of the new type by an artificial union of settlements and islands scattered across the whole globe, inhabited by different nationalities and connected to no tie except the accident that they happen to all acknowledge the Queen's authority. But I have pointed out, what we call our empire is no such artificial fabric, that it is not properly, if we exclude India from consideration, an empire at all, that it is a vast English nation only a nation so widely dispersed that before the age of steam and electricity its strong natural bonds of race and religion seem practically dissolved by distance. As soon then as distance is abolished by science, as soon as it is proved by the examples of the United States and Russia that political union over vast areas has begun to be possible, so soon Greater Britain starts up, not only a reality but a robust reality. 
it will belong to a stronger class of political unions. If we cannot say it will be stronger than the United States, we may say with confidence that it will be far stronger than the great conglomeration of Slavs, Germans, Turkomans, Armenians, Greek Christians, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, and Buddhists, which we now call Russia. Seeley and the Milner Group also recognized how a selective interpretation of the American federal system of organization could be repurposed for the aims of fortifying the proposed imperial federation of the empire. The romantic historical conception J.R. Seeley was seeking to reformulate for his own vision for Greater Britain was to view the American Revolution not with disappointment, but as the end result of Greater Britain's first experiment in expansion. He compared Greater Britain to a bubble that expanded and burst, and blamed the, quote, narrow-mindedness of King George III and the use of the old colonial system for creating the schism in the first place. Enlarging History for the English-Speaking Union Fellow Imperial Federation League member, Seeley lecturer, and later ambassador to the United States, James Bryce, in his book The American Commonwealth, were a major influence on Cecil Rhodes and his trustees and the imperial strategies for uniting the English-speaking people and fostering the Federal Union of South Africa. A worn and thoroughly marked copy was reportedly found at Rhodes' home, Groot Schur, in Cape Town, Bryce and his historical interpretations became so influential in England and the United States that despite being a British citizen, he became the president of the American Political Science Association from 1907 to 1908. To illustrate the sheer effectiveness of John Robert Seeley's ideas in this cultural campaign, I discovered the previous factoid regarding Rhodes' ownership of the American Commonwealth in a publication entitled The Landmark, the monthly magazine of the English-speaking Union, an organization founded by Rhodes' acolyte Evelyn Winch in 1918 and directly inspired by Seeley and Rhodes for the Union of the English-Speaking People. In the article, Teaching Our History by W. H. Gardner, it is declared that the English-Speaking Peoples are going to have to work together in the future, and each is desirous of understanding as much as possible of the others. Therefore, quote, each is getting a new concept of the meaning of our several histories. The English-Speaking Union article continues by asserting that it is desired to, quote, give a history of the American Commonwealth, one must begin, not with the events of 1776, but at the roots which reach back to the soil of England, back to at least the days of the Magna Carta and the Earl of Simon de Montfort, from which the roots sprang perhaps the most important causes of American secession. This is a perfect example of the type of enlarged historical context that John Robert Seeley had sought to proliferate to achieve Anglo-Saxon unity in an internationalist polity, a strategy put in motion by groups like the Anglo-American Pilgrim Society, which purchased George Washington's ancestral home, Soulgrave Manor in England, as a shrine of British-American peace in a pilgrimage for the English-speaking people. W. H. Gardner, in elaborating this new way to teach history, further states that once the English causes of American secession in the, quote, seeming independence of the American Commonwealth are mutually recognized, it will be understood that one cannot simply, quote, drop contemporaneous British history. As will be discussed at a later time, this is a sentiment professed in direct contradiction to that of the American Revolutionary period. It was none other than Thomas Paine, who staunchly proclaimed in common sense that not only can the British and whole of history be abandoned, but in fact we have it in our power to begin the world over again. In addition to Seeley Lecturer Bryce's American Commonwealth, another book which directly influenced the Rhodes and Milner Group strategies was written by a Milner recruit and historian named Frederick Scott Oliver, or F.S. Oliver. Oliver published a book entitled Alexander Hamilton, an Essay on American Union in 1906. This book attempted to draw conclusions from alleged parallels between what Hamilton faced in the struggle to replace the Articles of Confederation with the U.S. Constitution and those who sought a stronger union of the British Empire. This work by F.S. Oliver was very influential on Lionel Curtis and other members of the Milner Kindergarten while secretly planning for the unification of British South Africa. These efforts resulted in Lionel Curtis and other members of the Milner Kindergarten drafting the Selborne Memorandum which outlined the strategy of organic union and indirect rule by claiming that self-government within the South African colonies now constituted a federal type of union to be known as British South Africa. British South Africa as an enlarged ahistorical, poetic, and contextual conception was then to fit nicely within the wider rhetorical conception of Greater Britain and the Empire, which included the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The seed money for this project was provided in secret by Milner in the Rhodes Trust, and this was Seeley's organizational strategy taken to its logical conclusion. The technology of indirect rule. We seem, as it were, to have conquered and peopled half the world in a fit of absence of mind. John Robert Seeley, The Expansion of England. On March 3, 1905, Lord Alfred Milner resigned as the High Commissioner of South Africa and the Governor of the Transvaal, and gave a farewell speech that outlined his hope for the future of South Africa, and paid homage to the larger plans of J.R. Seeley and Cecil Rhodes. 
The words empire and imperial are perhaps in some respects unfortunate. They seem to suggest domination, ascendancy, the rule of a superior state over vassal states, but as they are the only words available, we must just make the best of them and try to raise them in a scale of language by giving them new significance. When we call ourselves imperialist, talk of the British Empire, we think of a group of states, all independent in their own local concerns, but all united for the defense of their own common interest in the development of a common civilization, united not in alliance, for alliances can be made and unmade, but are never more nominally lasting, but in a permanent organic union. Of such a union, the dominions of our sovereign as they exist today are, we frankly admit, only the raw material. Our ideal is still distant, but we deny it as either visionary or unattainable, and see how such a consummation would solve, and indeed can alone solve, the most difficult and most persistent problems of South Africa, how it would unite its white races as nothing else can. Lord Milner goes on to explain that, quote, the British can never, without moral injury, accept allegiance to any body politic which excludes their motherland, but the British and Dutch alike could, without any loss of integrity, without any sacrifice of their several traditions, unite in loyal devotion to an empire state, in which Great Britain and South Africa would be partners. Milner, of course, did not divulge his own financing and approval in the drafting of the Selborne Memorandum by his close associates. Lord Milner finishes by proclaiming that the road is long, the obstacles many, the goal may not be reached in my lifetime, perhaps not in that of any man in this room. You cannot hasten the slow growth of a great idea like that by any forcing process, but what you can do is keep it steadily in view, to lose no opportunity to work for it, to resist like grim death any policy which leads away from it. I know that the service of the idea requires the rarest combination of qualities, a combination of ceaseless effort with an infinite patience, but then to think on the other hand of the greatness of the reward, the immense privilege of being allowed to contribute in any way to the fulfillment of one of the most noblest conceptions which has ever dawned the political imagination of the mind. This imperial rhetoric of subordinate interdependence that Lord Milner was employing was consistent with what John Robert Seeley recognized in the expansion of England where he illustrated how new technologies of all types, official histories and rhetorical creations that buttress the national and today the growing international consciousness, could all be used to change the meaning of imperialism, to repair any old schisms and to foster common interests, and ultimately the development of a common civilization in permanent organic union of subordinate body politics that would still be allegiant to Greater Britain or an international polity or even a collectivized rhetorical humanity such as the League of Nations or later the United Nations, that would then be able to secure for itself an earthly immortality. In the most basic and modern terms, if you want everyone to run your digital application or programming, you need to be sure that they all have the same basic operating system as a medium of communicating its processes. The operating system that John Robert Seeley proliferated, which Cecil Rhodes and the Milner Group adopted and perfected, was the cultural project based on the unity of the English-speaking people. They planned for an enlarged historical context of the Anglo-Saxon, or Pan-Angle, in the English language medium, as a form of technology, to become the monopolistic expression of their state claim of our known reality. Human language is local and changeable, and is therefore incapable of being used as a means of unchangeable and universal information. Thomas Paine, The Age of Reason. And they did so while hiding behind the oratorical tradition, in the truth of the poetic and imperfect nature of all language, to accurately describe our true reality the knowledge of which played a major role prior to, during, and after the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Thomas Paine, John Adams, Noah Webster, and others recognized the noble lie of the supreme name-giver at the precipice of Plato's great chain of being that was eventually used as justification to give power to thrones. The destruction of these myths make claims of righteous universality and the unity of language and the arts become visible as falsified and artificial scarcities. These artificial scarcities have been used to maintain preeminent status and falsely perpetuate an arbitrarily defined, holistic balance over outsider cultures and the indigenous people that Cecil Rhodes viewed as barbarians. This is accomplished through the manipulation of context, and always at the cost and denial of the intrinsic value, rights, and particularity of the individual. This King of the Hill quest for what Marshall McLuhan would later call all at onceness in his pageant to claim victory and tribal ubiquity for the new electronic mediums as a, quote, return to poetic form, juxtaposed to the internalized individuality associated with print culture, eventually fails. This failure occurs when the foundations of a universal claim are exposed by omissions, when new information that undermines the initial assertion is found, or when individuals, indigenous cultures, values, and language continue to persist outside of, withdraw their consent from, or nullify the status quo of any claimed authority, law, or dominant culture. When these crashes of absolutism happen, state systems and actors tend to react with force, fraud, and coercion, 
as was demonstrated in the lead-up to the American Revolution by King George III. This continues today in the attempts of the modern state system and their agents to manage the consent of the body politic through propaganda, political correctness, and deception. It is a similar despotism of all previous empires, only now it is cloaked in a new benevolent appearance of indirect rule and representation, and it has been exported as an organizational structure that still dominates modern education in societies today. It is also codified in the very technology and feedback mechanisms that we can use to see beyond it. It has been widely overlooked how this systems thinking approach to achieving imperial organic unity was utilized by the Rhodes and Milner Roundtable Group in all areas of imperial society, across many public and organized spheres of influence, from propaganda in the press, the appropriation and distortion of federal organizational models, the consolidation of international banking, like the Bank of International Settlements, the ecumenical movements of the early 20th century, and the founding of the League of Nations, to the creation of international relations as a collegiate discipline that became the language medium of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and all of the other interlocking think tanks born from this imperial project since Rhodes' death in 1902. On June 11, 1909, the sixth day of the first imperial press conference in London, Lord Milner, Lord Morley, Winston Churchill, Arthur Balfour, and many prominent members of the imperial press across the empire gathered for a meeting on literature and journalism. The purpose of this meeting was described in the South African newspaper, The Advertiser, of June 12, 1909, in an article entitled, Closer Organic Unity, Purpose of the Press. The goal of the conference was for the imperialists to impart their praise on the imperial press, for striving to maintain the high traditions already won, and to further encourage them to impress the imperial idea upon the peoples of their land. This was yet another example of the use of emerging technologies that John Robert Seeley envisioned would allow England to achieve organic unity necessary to perpetuate itself. Harry Bertain's Bicontinental Pilgrim Society had already achieved the monumental feat of linking New York and London on the Atlantic Cable in 1904 by convincing their fellow pilgrim, George Gray Ward of the Commercial Cable Company, to make it happen free of charge and, quote, long before the age of broadcasting. This event was commemorated in the New York Herald as Pilgrims and Synchronous Symposia, and in the Daily Express as Pilgrims and Two Worlds Dined Together. It should be noted that Lord Roberts, who had served Cecil Rhodes' interest in the Second Boer War, was the first president of the British Pilgrims and the first Englishman to use the Atlantic Cable during this unprecedented event. Shifting the Body Politic by Controlling the Conversation in summation, J.R. Seeley and Cecil Rhodes both believed that if the British had been able to establish a centralized parliamentary system in the latter half of the 18th century, the American cause for independence and the entire American Revolution would have been avoided, and the absence of being able to achieve a global polity for the empire with any immediacy in his time, Rhodes wholeheartedly embraced Seeley's English-speaking idea as the best way forward for the ultimate recovery of the United States as an integral part of the British Empire. This idealized parliament was, in truth, undesirable to members of the Roundtable Group but it served as an attractive and effective rhetoric to many who felt that America should abandon isolationism and play a greater role in the affairs of the world, especially during the attempts to draw the United States into the League of Nations. What Rhodes and his trustees within the Milner Group definitely understood was how to capitalize on the overlapping circles or rings within rings of public and private influence peddling in order to manage public opinion on matters of foreign policy. If they could control the conversation, they could ultimately affect the decision-making of the politicians in their former colonies and existing dependencies. The strategy was often one of indirect rule, and the organizational structure, according to Rhodes, was to be based on the Jesuit order, inserting the Oxford ideal and Cecil Rhodes himself in the place of Ignatius Loyola. Lionel Curtis explained in his letter to Lord Lothian how the Milner Group was able to advance Seeley's goal because they had based their study on the relations of these countries on a preliminary field study of the countries concerned, conducted in close cooperation with people in those countries. This close cooperation was accomplished through the working groups similar to the earlier Imperial Federation League and the Anglo-American League, except the Roundtable Group understood the need to promote even greater organic unity with the political actors in each country or dependency. This strategy was then employed in the formation of programs and working groups such as the Seeley Lecturers, the Pilgrim Society, the Roundtable Journal of Commonwealth Affairs, the Williamstown Institute of Politics, the Rhodes Scholarships, the Rhodes Scholarship State Boards and National Committees, the American University Union in England, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Rockefeller General Education Board, and the aptly named English-Speaking Union. As detailed previously, the core members of the Rhodes Trust and Pilgrim Society were instrumental in the creation of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York after the Paris Peace Conferences of 1919. These consolidations of influence and power were part of an ongoing and profound shift 
in where the body politic exists, particularly in the United States, towards a government ran by committee, public opinion, and a very selective meritocracy. In describing Lord Alfred Milner's adherence to Seeley's earlier goals, George Beard, the first American and non-British subject brought into the secretive roundtable group in 1912, after they began researching the causes of the American Revolution, stated that only organic union in one body politic, with an exclusive imperial legislature and ministry solely responsible to it, will solve the problem as Lord Milner sees it. Beer was also a co-founder of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations, having served as the chief expert on Edward Mandel House's inquiry group and as a vocal advocate of the United States' involvement in World War I. At a gathering in London in 1929, R.G. Casey, who would later become the first Australian ambassador to the United States and an influential propagandist for the Milner Roundtable Group, recounted the following details to his Prime Minister in Australia regarding the intentions of Lionel Curtis in the role of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and its interdependent bodies. He showed how big business interests could work in with the Institute to their mutual benefit. He said how impressed he had been in the years since the war with the degree to which the city, by its manifold foreign relations, was instrumental in influencing international affairs and in the volume and quality of information they could add to the common fund of information on foreign affairs. He pleaded for greater use being made by the Royal Institute of International Affairs by the city, both as a bank in which they could deposit specific information and as a common fund which they could draw as required. Most of the big banks and business institutions maintain one or more men specifically to keep in touch with foreign affairs, either generally or in respect to particular countries which they had to do business, and these men were coming to regard the Royal Institute of International Affairs as a most useful source. The Foreign Office was under the disability that it could not maintain relations, either as regards to receiving or giving information, with private individuals or firms, but the Royal Institute was under no such disability. 200,000 have been donated towards the capital fund necessary to endow the Institute. Sir A. Bailey has given 100,000, and comparatively few others, the other 100,000. They will want probably another 100,000 before they are finished. As will be discussed in the next chapter in more detail, the plot for the federation of the world and the triumph of the English-speaking people of Greater Britain in the fostering of an internationalist polity was by Rhodes' bequest to be finally accomplished through the expansion and control of education in the common republic of letters around the world. Dr. George McLean, the director of the American University Union in Great Britain, explained with specificity that Rhodes' provisions are along the lines laid down by Oxford when she began her work of providing for the affiliation of colleges and the colonies and dependencies. McLean also confirms the role of the Carnegie Institution in Washington in providing funding and complementing this plan of worldwide scope that will bear rich fruitage beyond our anticipation in international, industrial, educational, and political realms. Mm -hmm.